Welcome and thank you for being here with us today for another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We have Justine Townsend with us. Justine is a CPA with your part-time controller, also one of our presenting sponsors, and we are so grateful to have Justine with us for this episode to talk to us about tips to getting that working budget that I know we all need. So before we dive into the conversation, we of course want to say thank you to our presenting sponsors and thank you to Julia Patrick, who is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. So thankful that you had this wonderful idea almost two years ago now to say, let's go on for two weeks. And now of course, you know, well beyond two weeks. Um, and I get to serve alongside you, Julia, as your co-host, I'm Jarrett Ransom, Julia's nonprofit nerd, but also your nonprofit nerd. There's enough to go around, CEO of the Raven Group. And during this week of gratitude, we, of course, have so much appreciation for our presenting sponsors. Continue to have these conversations thanks to their investment, not only here in these episodes and the nonprofit show, but truly the sector at large. I really like to remind everyone that these companies exist for you. They are on your team, on your roster. Please do lean into them as they lean into you and your communities to help you serve your community in a greater, bigger, bolder way. So thank you again to our sponsors. And thanks to Justine, who has joined us today to talk about budgeting and bravery. Welcome, Justine. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. You know, I think you have to be very brave to be a numbers person. Oh, I don't know. I think some of us just think that way. <laughs> and it's hard to not be a numbers person. You know, I feel like it's the budget process and the people in accounting that know the truth and how we articulate that to clients in our nonprofits and our donors and our philanthropic investors. It's a heavy lift. Mm-hmm. And those who do it well, really come ahead. And those that don't, I think really suffer. And if that's anything, if anything I've learned over the years um, in, the, in the nonprofit sector, that's one of the kind of, I would say almost truisms. It's, it's fascinating. And so you're going to be talking to us about part of this and that's the budgeting process. Mm-hmm. And so let's get into it because we only have you for 30 minutes, but I think we need you for like 30 days. <laughs> So how critical is it to have a budget in place for the new year? And I want to ask you this question with the lens of COVID, because there's still a lot of uncertainty or should there, or should that matter? Well, whether or not you have uncertainties, you need to have a detailed budget, right? Because our budget is the plan for how we're going to achieve our mission for the next year or three years or five years, depending on how long of a budget you're creating. But I think for this topic, we'll stick with, we're just talking about next year's budget, right? Just one year. And that is how are you going to fulfill your mission? How are you going to distribute those resources that we all know every nonprofit struggles with limited resources, right? And you know, we all have like bigger eyes than we have money to achieve um, all of the things that we want to do in our community, right? It's like, especially during Thanksgiving week, we think about having our eyes are too big for our food. Um, but we get a bigger plate than we should. I think uh, nonprofits, we do this a lot with our mission, right? We try to take on more than we can. And the budget is a bit of a reality check for that, right? When we go through that budgeting process, we say, how much can we reasonably achieve in this next year? And how are we going to do that? And we make that plan and having that plan ensures our success and ensures that we can pivot If we need to, it makes us a lot more nimble. You wouldn't think that, but having a detailed budget actually makes you more nimble. You know, okay, that, Jared, you you take it away because I have to think about that. I think think automatically my brain goes to the opposite, that it it hog ties me down. Jared, Mm -hmm. what do you think? 
Yeah, and, and I like what you just said, Justine, because it really does give us those parameters of where, you know, have we allocated these resources and how can we intend to use them over the course of this period of time? Um, one of the things that I know I have heard and learned throughout these last two mm-hmm. years is really, you know, we should put X percent in professional development, X percent in cybersecurity, X percent in this. And that for me already gives us a guideline for this forecasted budget. Um, And so I think that really sets the tone for the parameters. But then also as it comes to allocating those resources, I think that, you know, that's really where we have to focus our time. Um, And so having this critical need for that detailed budget, and as you said earlier, you know, if we are um, not, if we don't have a plan, then we're planning to fail. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We need this detailed plan. Exactly. And, you know, one of the ways that we become more nimble and that we can pivot with that detailed plan is by documenting the details, right? So, it all rolls up as board members or even as management of a nonprofit. A lot of times all we see is the big number, right? This is how much we're spending on salaries, the big number. This is how much we're spending on security. This is how much we're spending on this professional services. But what is included in that? What are uh, we putting in there to build up that total number? And how has that changed from prior year? And how are those changes going to help us achieve that goal? And really thinking through our numbers in that way, almost such that we're justifying our expenditures to ourselves as we're building that budget, we're making our justifications because eventually we're going to take this to a board, right? And say, please approve this. Yeah. Right. You know, I I think you're right. And I love that you're, you talk about exploring that. Now I want to ask you with that concept in mind, I can't imagine that there were too many, you know, brain surgeons across our, our sector that had figured out we were going to have a pandemic and that they (laughs) needed to be flexible. So I'm asking you, how do we consider this incredibly changing time and that we are as accurate as we can without being punitively damaged because we we couldn't tell that this was going to befall us that's a hard question no no it's a great question and when we have those details documented how did we get to those numbers with the pandemic it was there was actually a lot of budget cuts that you could make pretty quickly because you weren't going to have electricity, you weren't going to have you could shut down kind of the office and not be paying all of those utilities for a while, right? And then there were some kind of automatic increases on expenses we were going to have. I mean, I know for us it was technology, right? That's I'm sure for most organizations we made investments in technology. Um, And so knowing what you had over here that you're not going to spend because you documented those details gives you the opportunity to be able to pivot and say, well, I'm not spending this, so I can now add this in and still feel pretty safe that I'm going to hit my end goal of whatever my surplus, my budgeted surplus was. And we always budget surpluses. We never want to budget a loss, right? We always want to budget surpluses because that's more that you can do next year, right? That just helps your mission more next year. Um, We're going to reinvest that. And then we also want to build in contingencies, right? So when we know we're heading into a year of, you know, perhaps we could have a third big increase of this virus and have to shut down again, um, or it could mutate again, right? Um, Or who knows what could happen, right? We want to build in some contingencies and document what are, what are maybe our lowest hanging fruit to cut? Should this year turn negative? Should we not achieve this revenue goal? And this is a lesson we can use every year, not just in a post pandemic or a pandemic year, But every year we can build in a little bit of contingencies. If we want to put in a stretch goal for our revenue, 
to incentivize our development team to push themselves, well, then we want to make sure that we have also documented what the contingency is if we don't hit that stretch goal that we've built into our budget. What are we going to cut, right? And so having that documented in a very detailed way gives us that flexibility to cut when we need to. I feel like I've, I've, uh, I've never seen that. Jarrett, have you seen uh, that? Absolutely. You know, most of the organizations I work with, they have a plan A budget and then they have a plan B and their plan B, you know, they always say like, it's in the desk drawer. I know exactly where it is. And it typically, Justine, is the cut in personnel, right? It's that cut. Okay, who are the, you know, individuals and or departments that might need to, um, you know, be reduced if we need to go into our contingency plan and how will that impact our community and services? Um, so I have seen it. It's scary and it's scary to know that it exists. But I also think, again, it's that reality, you know, and it's, it's having that detailed budget for the what ifs um, mm -hmm. so that we're walking into, you know, the, the dark alley without knowing what's what's around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of, and I, you know, you want to identify the sine qua non, what your mission cannot survive without, right? And so when we go through the budgeting process, what are our sacred cows? What can we not live without? And then that tells us, should we have a bad year? Should we not hit our goals? These are the things we will never touch. And these are the things that are a little bit easier for us to play with, right? And so it's it's not necessarily having a plan B, but at least documenting what are the things that hurts your mission the least to cut, right? And sometimes that is personnel. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's, you know, it can be admin personnel. Um, but I would say, look at that though. Are those admin actually making it possible for you to achieve your mission? Is it maybe something else you could cut um, somewhere else? So this takes us really in dovetails into, you know, is it okay to revise this budget? And I do recall over the last couple of years, uh, really hearing from a lot of leaders saying, you know what, we will forecast our budget and we will visit it quarterly, if not monthly. So I'd love to learn from you, Justine, what you and, um, you know, really everyone at your part-time controller is sharing by way of revisions and how we should, you know, incorporate this best practice. So what we like to say is your budget, once it's approved by the board, that's your budget, right? And Unless everything changes, which certainly in the first year of the pandemic that happened, everything changed. And so you might want to go back and do a rebudget and have the board approve that. But truly from there, we'll forecast. So we'll take that original budget document, leave it where it is, leave that as our, because that's a, that's a benchmark, that's a point in time that we still want to measure ourselves against, right? Because we had a plan. That budget was a plan that we expressed numerically. And so we still want to benchmark against where are we on that plan. But then we'll have forecasts and we might have a first quarter forecast and a second quarter forecast and a third quarter forecast where we're updating that budget, but we're not calling it the budget. We're calling it a forecast so that we give ourselves that wiggle room, but are still always benchmarking ourselves against that original plan. So we're always reminding the board and ourselves what we gave up, what we're not getting done so that we don't forget to circle back and get it next year when we can, right? When we're planning for next year, we want to pick those things back up, especially if it was mission critical, right? So leaving that budget intact, that original budget intact gives us that opportunity to make sure that we're constantly going back to what did we plan to do that we didn't do and where do we go from here? That's a forecast, right? And sometimes we need a board approval for those and sometimes we don't. It just depends on the board. But that's one of the things that makes us more nimble with a forecast is a lot of times it doesn't require board approval and as much of that budget making process, right? You know, I think um, one thing that I've loved 
that I picked up from what you said, and it, it's a point of bravery because that kind of fits the theme of today's episode, mm-hmm. is you're using the word plan. And I feel like when you use that word with budget, it doesn't just mean, oh yeah, that's what the bean counters came up with in those cubicles in the dark side of the building. It, it kind of makes everybody more accountable, more integrated into what the process is. And I think overall, it helps you tell the story of where you are. I really appreciate how you've reframed this. Absolutely. I mean, it is very important to me and to everyone at YPTC. When we come on and we start working with an organization to prepare a budget, we're going to pull folks in, right? We, we're outsiders. <laughs> we need to know what you want and what you should see happen. And how does this work? And what are you willing to put into it? And so pulling more folks into the budget creates more ownership of that plan. So you see people following through and caring about it and being proactive, right? Saying like, it doesn't look like we're going to hit this revenue goal or I didn't get this grant. So how are we going to feed all of these people at the end of this year that we said we were going to feed? Gives you more time to say, you know, it's kind of like the Titanic, right? You can see the iceberg coming, so you have plenty of time to turn that giant ship away. But if you don't see it coming, you don't know. Right, right. It reminded me a lot, and and I wish I knew the author of this quote. So hopefully one of our listeners or viewers will, uh, will get on the Google. But people support that in which they help create. And so just... Mm have the buy-in and the leadership and the, you know, the conversation in this very authentic, transparent manner, as you were stating, people want to be a part of this. And so, you know, really going back to having uh, the buy-in and the support of the team um, is really, I think, advantageous. Um, you know, as, as we all move forward and I'm curious in that, I know we didn't touch on this really earlier, but, you know, when it comes to strategies for measuring budgets and tracking, mm-hmm. love for you to talk about that. And then also how do we take this from the numeric numbers into a narrative context? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll start with that. How do we take it into a narrative context? I'll start there and then we'll get into measuring it um, and tracking it, right? And saying, how are we doing? A, are we on plan or are we off plan, right? Um, but what I love and what we always do is when you're presenting a budget to the board, you want to present the narrative that goes with it. This is what's different than last year. This is what's the same as last year. And these are the things that are reaches. So if we don't get this, then we're not going to do this. Putting in there and making it very clear what your contingencies are and what those assumptions are so that the board is asking, okay, we didn't hit this revenue goal. So we're cutting this, right? This isn't happening. So the board can hold you accountable and say, we shouldn't be spending that money because we didn't hit this revenue goal. So why are you telling me that that money is being spent? Where is this new revenue going to come from? Giving the board those words will help them hold that story of the budget in their head all year long, right? When we're doing that budget to actual, and it really should be timely and on a monthly basis. Now we're getting into that monitoring and tracking. We should really should be looking at, okay, this is our original budget. Maybe here's our forecast from first quarter and our forecast from second quarter. And here's our actual first and second quarter results. And let's compare them. But we're going to do that not just quarterly, but monthly. Monthly, we're going to look at that budget. So we don't want a budget that is annualized. We need a budget that's broken down by month that takes into account seasonality of your business, right? Because nonprofits were all businesses and some of them are more seasonal than others, right? And so, so you really have meaningful results to track against. You want a budget according to your seasonality as well then it makes more sense, right? And you have something you can really track. 
And one of the things that I always point out to board members is whether or not it's a timing difference with the budget. This is, we're going to get it later or we're going to spend it later. Or if it's a permanent difference, we did not get this grant that we were planning to get, or we're not going on this trip that we were planning to go on because travel measures have changed. And so now we're not traveling. So there's some savings and here's where it's going. But keeping them up to date on that will help so much when you need to pivot and make an emergency decision, if you're holding in your head, what is the story and where are we in that plan and where are we on this tracking uh, according to this budget or forecast? Sorry, go ahead, Jared. No, and I think we all know that there's been a lot of we're going to move, you know, these dollars into this section now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think off the top of my head, Justine, you know, that really came into play when it um, fundraising events, right? Like actual fundraising events. And I know that many organizations went to the digital space to still, you know, um, solicit their constituency base. But there have been some organizations that are up on their second year of not having or holding or hosting their big fundraising event. And that is a huge revision and a really big need for that narrative uh, conversation. And I'm thinking not just with the board, but the leadership and, and all individuals within the organization. Absolutely. Well, and going to the program people, saying we're not having this gala so we're going to have to do less where can we make cuts or are there ideas you have maybe of what we can put online to connect donors to our mission more you know we we can't throw them a party so maybe we can get them more in touch with our mission right so maybe we make the connection there instead of making the connection and that touch point a party point but instead a mission touch point. And we go to our friends in programming to help us make that connection, right? And we've seen that, Julia, it makes me think of the organization Animal Shelter, of course, that they were not you know, able to bring in volunteers. So they literally turned on like FaceTime or you know, streaming and just walked the halls, if you will, of the kennel. And that was a huge pivot that really, you know, reaped some rewards in a lot of ways, um, but mainly financially, as well as increase of adoption. Well, and it keeps that touch point going. So one of the things that I have noticed and am advising as we're budgeting for next year, don't budget based on the gala you had in 2018 right? Because not everybody's coming back. Great point. And it's going to take you some time. So you might want to look at where has your donor engagement declined and how much? And if you can kind of estimate a percentage of your donor engagement decline, then you can estimate a percentage of your gala revenue decline. Um, but then you should have expenses that are reduced that offset that because you're not feeding as many people, right? So they're it, really taking a look at that and thinking very carefully as you're planning about how all of this is going to impact your next year. I mean, you're guessing, but taking note of those guesses really helps. Well, the other right? thing about yeah. two not all organizations have seen a decrease. In fact, some organizations mm -hmm. have a significant increase in financial support. My question, and I'd love to know from you and YPTC, what are your best practice when it comes to forecasting that sustainability? Well, that is, we look at where is that coming from, right? Where, what is the source of that increase? Is it um, from all of this kind of additional government funding we've been able to get? Um, and then are you gonna be able to replace that with the ARPA funds, right? So we have the American Recovery Plan. We have the infrastructure bill that just came out. We have all of these new kind of revenue sources that are gonna come down. Like I know in Texas, we just got $10 billion in ARPA funds that is going to trickle down to a lot of our clients. And a lot of our clients are gearing up to spend a lot more money in 2022 than they did in 2021 
because of those ARPA funds. So are there replacements on deck for you? And if not, if you're going to see a constriction of revenue, what is that going to look like? Where is that going to come from? What signs are you seeing? How have you evaluated the sustainability of your funding? And if you're losing funding, what are you replacing it with, right? And, you know, to me, when I hear you say that, I go back to the very first weeks of um, the nonprofit show, and we had your managing director on, Jennifer Oliva, and mm -hmm. she literally had her phone coming. She was coming out of the East with your main office. She literally had her phone on during the show when there were votes going on mm -hmm. and, and to say, okay, okay, well, you know, and I mean, it was like literally a day-to-day -day thing and how it changed what I hear you saying, she said at the time, the narrative, mm -hmm. because you're asking your board who's doing a lot of other things to come in and grasp a major concept. And so to your point, I love just seeing the concept of that narrative so that you can be brave. You can tell that story mm -hmm. and plan as opposed to just getting bamboozled by a series of numbers and lines that don't necessarily help you make a decision during that meeting. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And having that plan and being able to hold that narrative in your head really helps board members make those decisions and feel comfortable fulfill, fulfilling their fiduciary responsibility right. to be able to make those decisions responsibly and to ensure the sustainability of the organization and the mission. Well, this has been great. And I think that you have helped me to realize that um, we can be brave and maybe more intelligent. Mm. It's not just an emotional, okay, I'm gonna be brave and bite the bullet, but that it is, it's an intelligent process because I think, and Jared, I'm sure you would agree, um, anything that we know is a change is still here and still coming. You know, we are not through, you know, all, all clear. I mean, there's still so many things that are up in the air and so, this is the time for our nonprofits to really be even more strategic. Don't you think that, Jared? I mean, what do you what do you see? One of my biggest takeaways that I hope that I hear around more uh, board tables is what is our contingency plan? <laughs> I would love to hear those words, right? Like to really know, okay, yes, this is where we are. This is what we're currently working with, and we can forecast you know, and, and be as detailed as we want. And we need to also consider our contingency plan. And as you said, Justine, these very clear benchmarks of, you know, if this, then that, uh, and having that outlined so clearly is one, probably one of my biggest takeaways from today. And I'm just so grateful. You know, we started by saying, uh, you know, it, it's brave to be a numbers person. And Justine, I'm so grateful that you are. Because <laughs> I, and to know that you are here in our corner and in our sector for all of those watching today and our 1.8 million nonprofits that are registered throughout the U.S., we are so very grateful to have your uh, intelligence in this, as well as your partners throughout your part-time controllers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to chat with you and hopefully give some folks the opportunity to improve their budget process and yeah. feel braver to go into it. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a lot more empowered. And I also think that, um, you kind of spoke to a lot of things that I've been recognizing, but maybe couldn't articulate. And I, and I love the way you pulled some things together. Again, to remind everyone, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined by my nonprofit nerd, your nonprofit nerd, the nonprofit nerd, Jarrett Ransom. Um, again, Jarrett, I love how you said this this morning, the week of gratitude. We have a lot of gratitude for our sponsors every day, but I think you're right. I mean, this is a week of gratitude and, and certainly um, our presenting sponsors allow us to be here and have uh, these amazing conversations like we've had today with Justine. So please um, make sure that you reach out to them and let them know that you are as appreciative as well. Wow, okay, I have a board uh, coaching session in a little bit. 
I think I'm going to repeat a lot of what you said today. What? Yes. <laughs> I love when we can use it right away. Yeah. I mean, like we're talking 30 minutes. So you're, you're going forward with this sister. <laughs> hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode, we want to remind you to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.